Yes, Doctor, we can see. And I would appreciate it if you can make your screen full screen. Okay. Yes, thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, so, okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to my uh, presentation. Um, it's a great honor to participate in this international conference organized by Near East University. As you can see on my screen, my intervention is about the opportunities and challenges facing the future development of international environmental law. Uh, my presentation aims to provide some essential elements of uh, formation and development of international environmental law and present some challenges facing the international community. Uh, as you probably know, international environmental law as a new branch of public international law emerged basically in the 1970 decade. Since that time, global environmental protection has become a significant concern uh, and preoccupation of international community. Climate change, air pollution, drinking water, waste and hazardous substances, soil protection, loss of biodiversity, noise and light pollutions are the contemporary preoccupation of humanity. The international community has recognized the environmental protection that must be addressed holistically and globally. In this context, the purpose of environmental law is to reduce or prevent environmental harm by imposing rules and regulations. Um, in general, international environmental law is divided into three generations. First generation start before the formation of international environmental law until 1972, the Stockholm Conference. This generation began mainly from the 18th century which the bilateral agreements in the field of fisheries, high seas, and marine life resource. The majority of treaties were bilateral based on common interest of a state. For this reason, the govern governing principle was reciprocity of obligation, which is called in international law, seek omnes obligations. Following industrial development and economic revolution in the, waste, the Western countries, especially environmental activists and scientists warned that if industrial process and progress continue the same way, the world would be destroyed. As a result, by the end of 1960 decade, the states were forced to hold the Stockholm Conference in 1972. And second generation start from the Stockholm Conference until the Rio Conference in 1992. According to recommendation of the United Nations General Assembly, the International Conference on the Protection of Iran Environment was held in June 1972 in Stockholm. The Stockholm Declaration recognized the right of development to be closely linked to environment by identifying to right the healthy environment as a fundamental human right. According to this document, environmental issues should be at the forefront of international cooperation. This declaration marked uh, the start of dialogue between developed and developing countries on the link
between economic. This generation of environmental law has recognized a fundamental right to environment, according to the principle first of the Stockholm Declaration. Man has the fundamental right to freedom, equality, and adequate condition of life as an environment of quality that permits a life of dignity and well-being, and he bears a solemn responsibility to protect and improve the environment for present and future generations. Another important outcome of the Stockholm Conference was the establishment of international body called the United Nations Environmental Program, UNEP. UNEP is the United Nations Affiliated Environmental Protection Program that has been one of the most essential pillars of international protection in the world. In this period, several international treaties, including convention, protocol, agreements, uh, and so on, has been negotiated and adapted by a state. These uh, multilateral treaties are concluded by the active participation of non-state actors and non-governmental organization. Most of the treaty were based on treaty laws distinguished from treaty contracts on the first generation. So the third generation of international environmental law begins with the 1992 Rio conference on environment and development. In Rio conference, the United Nations Convention on Climate Change, UNFCC, and Convention of Biological Diversity, which were drafted before the Rio conference, were open in the conference for signature of a state. The Rio conference establish some regulation to achieve sustainable development and mark a new turning point in developing international law. In addition, the Rio conference concluded with the adoption of three non-binding instruments, including the conference uh, final statement, Agenda 21, and the principle of forest conservation. The Rio declaration affirmed that the state should always be concerned with environmental preoccupation in their economic and development and their industrial growth. Furthermore, the state should consider sustainable development as an approach in their national plans. Also, uh, they should consider the principle of sustainable development in the national laws and international agreements. We also recognize the rule of social group and non-governmental organization in protecting the national, regional, and global environment. Another remarkable event in this period is the Agenda 2030 for sustainable development. The agenda aims at a plan of action for sustainable development, straining universal peace and eliminating poverty. In this generation, the right to the environment and the right to development are recognized by international law. Therefore, the third period of the development process of environmental law could be called the period of realism, universalism, and reforms. Now, let's turn to the source of international environmental law. International environmental law is based on two types of non-binding and binding sources. Non-binding sources or soft law is not obligatory and has no specific warranties and guarantees. This source is included in statements, resolution, agenda, action plans, and rules that guide the governments to protect the environment. The main purpose of soft law is to express the non-obligatory principles and rules that guide governments to protect the environment in a flexible manner. Although these sources are not binding in themselves, they have a very important impact 
on the development of international environmental law. The most important examples of this source of are the Stockholm Declaration, the Universal Charter of Nature of 1982, the Rio Declaration, the Agenda 2030. Again, the drafting and implementation of these action plans or statement allow governmental and non-governmental actors to cooperate together. The second source of international environmental law is binding law or hard law, which imposed obligatory rules and regulation on government to take international responsibility in governmental issues. In this essential uh, to mention here that source of international environmental law go beyond the public international law. Also, Article 38 of the statute of the International Court of Justice mentioned about the traditional source of public international law. The other sources also apply to environmental law, such as jusquegens, ergonomics, obligatory resolution of international organizations such as UNEP, CITES, and another uh, international organization uh, for protecting environment. Uh, now let's talk, uh, look, at, uh, look at the fundamental principle of international environmental law. One of the main, most important models of analysis of international environmental law is the examination of its basic principles and concept. This model can facilitate understanding many international environmental treaties. Today, almost all international environmental instruments, binding or non-binding, contain or refer to this principle and concept. One of the basic principles of international law is the principle of sovereignty. However, the concept of sovereignty is not absolute. It is subject to a general duty to not to cause environmental damage to the environment of other states or area beyond the state national uh, jurisdictions. Um, as I stated in the Rio Declaration, states have under the Charter of the United Nations and the principle of international law, the sovereign right to exploit their resource according to their own environmental and development policies, and the responsibility to ensure that activity within their jurisdiction or control do not cause damage to the environment of other states or area beyond the limit of national jurisdiction. The principle of international cooperation is another principle that is an integral part of the United Nations Charter. The principle is also one of the features of contemporary international law, which is mandatory and take the state, uh, it take from the customary uh, international law and uh, for expressing global commitment of state. Due to transboundary nature of environment, because for environment there is no any boundary, states are obliged to cooperate in all circumstances in good faith to protect the environment. Uh, and it can be said that principle of cooperation is based on universal obligations and is rooted from the customary international law. Another principle of international law is precautionary principle. This principle is a key principle of environmental law because the concept of this principle, according to Article 3 of the UNFCC, is whether there are threat of serious damage, lack of full scientific certainty, should not be used as a reason for postponing such measure. Under this rule, a state be obliged to apply precautionary measure to prevent damage. Within its own risk, 
another basic principle that can be uh, tracked back to the International Court of Justice from the 1949 Corfu Strait case. And another international sources such as environmental treaties and agreements are affirm the principle of notification in international law. The last principle which I'm going to talk about it is the principle of sustainable development. The 1987 Brundtland Commission presented the most well-known definition of sustainable development in a report entitled or common future, which cited sustainable development as meeting current needs with forgetting the need of the next generation. The efforts of the international community to formulate and uh, the achieve sustainable development goals have continued since 1919 decade. One of the most important documents for formulating the sustainable development goals was Rio Declaration and Agenda 21. Then the Millennium Development Goals, MDGs, adopted by the United uh, General Assembly in 2000, is for the purpose to ensure environmental sustainability by encouraging a state to address extreme poverty, hunger, empowering women, reducing child mortality, improving uh, mental health, disease, and uh, expanding global partnership for development. However, the implementation of sustainable development confronted some challenges in its form and concept. In terms of content, it lacks of comprehensive approach for including indigenous people, local cultures, good governance, cost, um, consuming resource, producing goods and services, uh, freedom of expression, employment, identifying the root of poverty and gender discrimination. There are also some other principles and concepts such as the common heritage of humanity in international law or the right of future generation. Uh, regarding the challenge facing the future of uh, development of international environmental law, despite all global efforts to develop binding and non-binding global instruments in environmental concern and threat such as global warming, climate change, desertification, and deforestation are not only remaining, but also increasing. Today's world environmental concern and threat go beyond the prediction of the expert and scientist present at Stockholm first environmental conference in 1972. The first challenge is sovereignty, state sovereignty. Regardless of the concept of sovereignty of state in international law, one of the main obstacles for the development of international environmental law is the non-acceptance of government to delegate or limit their sovereignty in favor of international organizations. The principle of sovereignty is one of the basic principles of in public international law. However, the concept of sovereignty is not absolute and it is subject to general duty not to cause environmental damage. Another conflict also exists between developed and developing countries in enforcing uh, regulations, implementation of environmental law, as you can see in uh, COP26 in Glasgow. For instance, according to principle of common but uh, differentiated responsibility, developed countries should take additional actions such as transferring technologies and contributing finance to developing countries. But this principle is not respected properly. This principle clearly set out in many international environmental treaties, such as UNFCC uh, or CBD, and mandate developed countries to financial resource to assist developing countries 
in the implementing the objective uh, for protect the climate change or biodiversity. The second challenge is diversity of source of law. Another substantive challenge to developing international law is diversity of binding and non-binding sources, which is cause confusion and vagueness in implementation of international law at the national and international level. The insufficient guarantee of implementation of international environmental law is another fundamental challenge for in implementing international law. Many international rules and regulations, including multilateral treaties, are confronted with a deficiency of compliance mechanism to protect the environment. The fourth challenge is institutional challenges. With the growing importance of global environment protection since the 1972s decade, international governmental organizations have tried to play important role in environment protection. As active subject of international law, international organization, including uh, non-governmental organization, have a serious task to behave in this regard. As I mentioned earlier, one of the essential reflections holding the Stockholm Conference was establishing the United Nations Environmental Program, or UNEP, as the global executive arm of international protection of the environment. But unfortunately, the UNEP has limited capacity to protect the global environment. As a result, is a time to evaluate possibilities for creating a new organization for environmental protection, like um, uh, World Environmental Organization, the same as uh, international uh, organization that exists for another subject. Finally, I believe there are also new challenges in the world. Environmental immigrants, ecological uh, purposes refugees, uh, environmental confrontation between states, such as water war, international armed conflicts, ecocide, ecoterrorism are issues that have to be discussed in another occasion. To conclude my presentation, we know that global challenges need global solutions. In this perspective, international cooperation between a state play a vital role. Economic growth and increasing technological advances in the contemporary period have caused real damages to the environment. The states should be willing to participate actively in drafting, signing, ratifying, and implementing new treaties on environmental problems such as climate change and water pollution, sea pollution, ocean pollution, in a sustainability way. It is also crucial to recognize the right of public participation in the environmental decision-making process and implementation. The right to uh, environment as a human right and economic development should be considered in the concept of sustainable development as a common concern of humanity. Now is the time for the international community to impose absolute responsibility of or strict liability of a state for any damage and harm to environment at national and international level. Finally, international peace and security are necessary to ensure sustainable development of humanity, regardless the developed or developing country. Uh, thank you for paying attention at my presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Abbas, for your valuable 